So questions from last week? Questions from last week? Questions from last week. What were we talking about? I know about. I know about, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's the difference between when do you use ANOVA and when do you use regression? What would be some logic that you might use? It's oftentimes a good set of logic to use. We can we can we can make uh, regression do what we do with ANOVA, but we might lose uh, some information and vice versa. But yeah, that's that's pretty good logic. So if you have a continuous input or continuous independent variable, um, regression probably is a better choice. Um, what's wrong with just taking your independent variable? Let's say we're measuring age. What's wrong with just making that into a grouping variable? Let's say we want to do young, middle, old. What's wrong with that? Throwing away some nuance. What's that? You're throwing away some nuance. Yeah, yeah so you'd be everybody, if, if young is going to be from 0 to, what do you guys, you guys are all young, uh, from, from 0 to 40. Uh, <laughs> there's got to be some nuance there. Uh, uh, 25. Uh, and uh, of course, there's a lot of difference between somebody that's four and somebody who is 18, right? And so that would be that would probably be uh, a lot of nuance that you would lose. And likewise, as you mature, uh, you ch I mean, so a lot different than you know between 40 and and 60, and 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 so and I think that probably um, so yeah, and so. Uh, it's probably not a good choice in most cases to take your continuous input, your continuous independent variable, whatever that is, and try to make it into a grouping variable just to fit it into the framework of ANOVA. It, because there's, you're, you're throwing away nuance or good information uh, about, your, about your sample that, that in most cases we, pro we probably don't want to do. Um, um, what else can we ask about? Uh, what else can we ask about ANOVA? Um, uh, one way ANOVA would be, one. and if I have a, if I say I have a, a three by two ANOVA, three by two ANOVA. What does that? What does the three? What does the two represent? Three levels. Three levels on the first independent variable. Two levels on the second. Two and and so what is it a what way very what way ANOVA? It's a two way ANOVA, right? And so um, that that vernacular gets used a lot. I did a three by three experimental design, and what they mean is they have a three conditions in one independent variable, three conditions in a yet. Yeah, Separate independent variable that they manipulated, uh, in all likelihood, if it's an experiment, and um, and we would call that a three by three ANOVA. That would that you'd use a, a two way uh, ANOVA to probably analyze that data. So um, it sounds like we we can um, pick up where we left off last week, and I did just change I did just change the assignment. I never changed the due date. I, it was still set to be due today. I just changed it now to the which is next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So 3 o'clock on the 5th would be you doing the assignment number 5, which is a two-way ANOVA, which we're going to we'll easily get through that content today, and that'll be due next. That'll be due next week. That means I don't have to grade anything this weekend, right? Good, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
sleep in on Saturday, no. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep that in the back of our mind, and we'll, we'll um, make it a point to review that before all is said and done today, just to make sure, because it was last week when we reviewed that, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So um, we're still talking, I actually have um, four or five, uh, maybe seven or eight more slides on still in the framework of um, one way ANOVA, although much of what we're going to talk about from here until we get to a multi-factor ANOVA uh, will apply to both one way ANOVA and multi-factor ANOVA. So, and effect size would, would be a, a good example of that. And so I just list here a few effect sizes and give you those calculations. And then we'll calculate a few of these as we as we move forward over the uh, next couple hours uh, to uh, hopefully make them a little bit more concrete. Remember, with regression, it was almost universal, and it is almost universally placed. We're doing ordinary least squares regression. That is, your outcome variable is a continuous variable. R square is the only effect size I ever see reported there. ANOVA, it's a bit different where there are some other effect sizes that people report. You could easily report R square if you chose to, um, but there are other effect sizes that mostly based on training probably and some personal preferences people use. And in a lot of cases, the differences across the different effect sizes are, are marginal. It won't make the difference between something that's solid, small effect to something that is solidly medium size effect. You might be right in the border between, by the way, what do we say R square, R square for a small size effect would be? Close. Close only in that you just forgot a zero, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's 0 0.01. <laughs> uh, it's 0 0.01 uh, for a small R square medium would be? No. There's a point on that. Got it, got it, good, that's good, very good. So 0 0.01, 0 0.09, and 0 0.25, so small, medium, and large. So across these, we're not gonna, you're not gonna notice differences that are gonna be, again, solidly in one of those. If it's small, it's gonna remain small, almost regardless of what effect sizes that you use. So we have this thing that we call eta squared. Um, and it's equal to R squared. So, uh, and we have this thing that SPSS reports for us that's called partial A squared, and don't confuse it with A squared. And, and I'll, I'll explain why here in a minute. So partial A squared um, is, is uh, just a derivative of A squared. So we have A squared, which is equal to R squared. And as you think back to uh, our understanding of both regression and ANOVA, uh, R square is equal to good sums of squares divided by total sums of squares, right? And that's what we're doing here, but in this case, instead of calling it uh, sums of squares regression, we're calling it sums of squares between groups. So SS between group divided by sums of squares total. And we'd be able to, and we'll do this in a minute, you could go to the ANOVA table, and you can find sums of squares total, and you can find sums of squares between, between group, and you could divide that out. And that's going to be, that will be, that will be A to square. Um, and also, uh, you could call that R square, and nobody could, uh, nobody could quibble with you because it, the math is exactly the same. It would be more typical if you're doing ANOVA to report it as A to square, though. Not for any good reason that I can see, but it just is more typical to report A to when we're doing regression and R square when we're doing um, when we're doing um, ANOVA, uh, or R square when we're doing regression and eta when we're doing uh, ANOVA. And so then partial eta squared is what we get when we ask SPSS for effect sizes. And as I recall, you still have to. That's a preference you choose when you uh, run your analysis, and we'll, we'll do that here in a minute just to confirm that. But you have to ask for effect sizes, and what it gives you is partial eta square. And partial eta squared is defined as the proportion of the total variation attributable to the factor, excluding all other factors that are um, uh, 
in your analysis. So if you have a two-way ANOVA, you have two factors. And partial eta squared would be uh, the proportion of the variance of one of the factors excluding the other factor uh, from, that, from that calculation. And the formula for partial eta squared is the sum of the squares between groups divided by sums of squares between groups plus sums of squares within groups. And, um, and it's just, we're just taking out, um, it, again, if there's uh, several sums of squares between groups because you have two factors, for example, you're ta you're, you'd be taking whatever factor up. And in a one-way ANOVA, partial eta squared is equal to eta squared. And if you, if, you're, if you follow that, you're good. If you don't follow that, um, you're not bad, but um, we can go back and um, uh, think about that, that a little bit. In a one-way ANOVA, there is only one, there is only one factor. So there's nothing, there's nothing to partial out. We're not partialing out any very, so in a one-way ANOVA, partial eta squared is equal to eta squared is equal to r squared. And so one of, one of my pet peeves, well, it's really not, I, I don't lose too much sleep over it, but if somebody reports, they're doing a one-way ANOVA and they report partial eta squared, it's not, it's not horrible, but it does show somewhat of a misunderstanding of that because it, 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 it and it's just because that's what, SPSS calls it partial eta squared too, even in a one-way ANOVA. And so I can see where people would do that, but, but it really, and so is it wrong? Probably not, um, um, but it is, it is uh, if it were me, I would always, in a one-way ANOVA, I would always just report eta squared because uh, partial eta squared. There's nothing to partial out. You're making it seem like you partialed something out when, in fact, there's nothing to partial out, and so why report that you did just because SPSS um, gave you that. Another effect size that gets reported probably, well, certainly less than, than the other two, but you do see it from time to time is omega squared, and I give you the formula for it, and um, it is an estimate of the variance accounted for by the independent variable in the population. So it tries to make some kind of an adjustment in your analysis so that it, um, it can, it can uh, better speak to the population as opposed to just the sample that you're working with. To the extent that you should have uh, full confidence that that, that is, um, it's not, a, it's not a point estimate of the population effect size. There would be a, conf, there'd be a conf, margins of error or confidence interval that you put around that. And so it's not, it's not a precise point estimation, even though um, in some cases it, it's sort of um, presented that way. But it really isn't. It's just it's, it's an estimation that, that has... Um, um, you know, we're 95% confident that it's between this point and, and some other point that would be higher than this. So these are effect sizes. Partial eta squared is what we see in ANOVA, which is um, probably most relevant here. Looking back at our example, and let's go back and just refresh our memories here. The example that we talked about uh, last Wednesday, the uh, dependent variable was how many days per week the respondent reports that they talk about politics with family, friends, co-workers. <coughs> so that's the dependent variable, how much they discuss politics. And then the independent variable was whether they self-identified as uh, somebody who's independent politically, somebody that is uh, Democrat, or somebody that uh, is, is Republican. And, um, and there was a significant, there was a significant, um, there was a significant, um, um, effect for um, party ID. Um, what does that sort of thinking just sort of bring us back to where we ended up? Or, or uh, does this tell us much of anything here? What does this tell us? This tells us what? Because we have Democrat, Republican, and Independent, right? And this tells us that it's significant. Does it tell us any more than that? What else do we, are Democrats higher than independents? Democrats lower than Republicans? Do we know that from this? No, from our 
we, we could look here and find some of that, right? Because we know that if we just uh, organize them hierarchically, Republicans talk most, Democrats talk second most, independents discuss politics least. But we don't know, these are just the means, right? And that's all. But we don't know whether those, this just tells us, this just tells us there's a, there's a meaningful difference somewhere in here. It might be all three possible combinations might be meaningfully different, or it might be just one of the three are meaningfully different, but we don't know. And, and we, don't, we don't get that from just looking at the ANOVA table here. So is that, is that clear? And so um, that, is, that is where we have to sort of drill down and do the group comparison that we would that we do, and in this case, we'd be justified in doing that because um, our main effect for um, for party ID is significant. If this was non-significant, it would be a useless exercise uh, under most conditions. Um, but there is no there is no meaningful there there likely would be no meaningful. Um, uh, findings that you would be able to point to. The differences would just be no greater than you'd expect to get by chance. So getting back to here, if we take that same ANOVA table, and if we want to calculate R squared and eta squared, I can take our sums of squares between groups and divide it by sums of squares total, where I can get that from, from here. Our sums of squares between group is uh, uh, 53.46, and our sums of squares total is 4,565, and I do that math, and I get that we're explaining um, 1%, so small, medium, or large. Small, right? Not, not, it's small, but that doesn't mean insignificantly small, right? It doesn't mean not useful small, it doesn't mean ignore it small, but it's, it's nonetheless small. But, um, but um, it shouldn't be taken as only 1%, why bother? Uh, um, because it, 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 there is a meaningful difference there, greater than we expect to be by chance. And then if we wanted to do partial a to square, um, because we only have one way ANOVA that we're working with now, the, the calculation would be, um, it's really the same because add these two together, we get um, 4,565. And so, because a to, partial a to square is equal to uh, a to square, which is equal to r square, of course, these two calculate as the same. And then, if we do um, our omega squared and just do the calculations for it using the formula that I had on the previous page, which I'll never ask you to do for this class, but um, we can see that it is it is it is slightly lower, although not in not in a um, in a um, in, in a way that you would make judgments about it that are um, uh, at completely at variance with, with the kinds of judgments you would make with our um, just slightly over one percent of the variance claim. So um, those are effect sizes. We'll get back to calculating. Sorry, uh, we'll get back to calculating uh, partial eta square when we do. When we start looking at two-way ANOVA, and so you'll be able to see some examples of, of how this would look different than this in, um, in, in a lot of time. So um, getting back to where, um, where I left off when we talked about, well, we have this, this significant effect for party identification, but that doesn't tell us is Democrats significantly different than Republicans? Is Democrats significantly different than independents or are Republicans significantly different than Republicans? It doesn't, doesn't tell us anything about that. We need to do what we call group comparisons for that um, and uh, given, given uh, that, you know, and really this is the same thing that I just said, that we've just identified that there's a difference there somewhere we don't know which of the three comparisons, the three that I just listed, are significantly different. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do these, what we call post hoc tests. Um, 
in some cases, we might not make any correction. In other cases, we might make uh, a meaningful correction. And the thing that we're correcting for is for type 1 air ridge. Um, can we correct for type 1 air rate in a vacuum? If we correct for type 1 air rate, what are we also doing? We are referencing the population. We are saying we are referencing the sample and the population. So I need to know, and they may, must be some play, meaning that it's a comparison, so it can't be in absolute terms. Yeah, uh, I agree, but. If we, let's say we make, let's say we make uh, alpha really stringent to correct for type 1 error. Ah, then I go back into the type 2 error. Right, you can't make it, you, there's no free lunch, right? If you correct for type 1 error, uh, you're going to pay a price uh, by increasing the likelihood of making type 2 error. They're just, and vice versa, if you say, I'm just not going to make any type 2 errors, well, guess what? You, you, you can really you can you can be very conservative and correct for that mm -hmm. in an extreme manner, but then that means that you're gonna uh, in all likelihood make type one error. And so it's not a it's not a panacea. There is uh, best way that I can think about it is it, there's just there's a price to be paid. There's not a free lunch. There is a um, there's a cost to to um, these kinds of these kinds of of trade offs that we make. And a cost that, that we just have to balance uh, uh, our needs, uh, particularly, um, um, I think it becomes more acute when we're when we're studying phenomena that that um, if we're studying communication apprehension as as important as that is and as significant that, as that is for the the betterment of mankind. Or all humans, uh, it probably doesn't rise to the same level as cancer research uh, in terms of uh, improving lives. Uh, and so um, there are places where these trade offs become uh, much more consequential than in some of the social science research that, that we all do. Uh, not saying that, of course, that that is inconsequential. Um, so, a lot of different postdoc tests. A common one that we'll talk about, and I don't know if it's the most, com most common, uh, we could easily do a search in um, the literature for post hoc tests and then calculate who, what post hoc tests people have used for the last 25 years of communication research and we could answer this empirically. I, my sense is that it's at least as popular as any post hoc test out there, um, but there are people that use some different post hoc tests. Um, the and, them. What's that? The it's them. just uh, some of it, and we'll, we'll see a couple examples here, Amanda, but it really has to do with um, uh, how conservative you want to be with protecting against type 1 error, which means that you sort of open yourself up to making type 2 error, uh, or vice versa. There might be some that, that would be, um, I mean, a form of post hoc test would be, I'm not going to make any correction at all. Uh, for the likelihood of making uh, type 1 error. And um, and then you're just going to, you're probably not going to make a type 2 error, but you would increase your chances of making uh, a type 1 error. So the, 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 the corrections, and there's actually sort of a, I should try to find, there's sort of a, um, what would, it's, a it's a graphic, uh, I don't know that it's a cartoon, I think it's a cartoon. Nobody would get it though, unless you were a, a sort of a data person. I'll see if I can find it. I don't know if find that. I know I don't have it on my computer. But there's a cartoon where um, there's three different, um, three different, um, um, I think they're all cartoons of men, and three different men that have different names above them, and their different names <laughs> represent the different kinds of corrections you might do. And so one of the corrections is, and they, they go from con most conservative to most liberal. And um, and uh, the the one correction, one of the corrections, which is really not a correction, and we call it least significant difference. And if you LSD, least significant difference is one of the forms of corrections. And so that guy is sort of this liberal hippie guy that is doing the 
least significant difference mm -hmm. correction, and then the bond Peroni correction, which is a more conservative one. It's more of a prim and proper. I'll have to see if I can find. Somebody um, get their computer out and Google for, yeah, Google for, um, what, we, what I would Google for post hoc test. Um, well, that's not going to do it for you. Um, um, but it's not really an infographic. Amy Johnson had it, and I saw uh, uh, something that she had a long time ago, and I never have um, uh, had it. Well, maybe, maybe I've had it, but I just, I just have my slides still here. But if we find it, uh, it, 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 it really isn't particularly instructive, but it, it is a way to uh, think about these different uh, post-hoc tests that we might do. So we're going to talk about Bon Peroni, because I think it's the most popular in it. It really provides the intuition that we use for any of the other calculations that you might do. And in this case, uh, it calculates a new alpha to keep your family wise, is the term that we use, which is the probability that any one set of significance tests is a type 1 error. So when we talk about family wise alpha, that's looking across all of the comparisons that you're doing with your test. And so in our case, with our example, we have our, our grouping variable has three different groups. We have three possible comparisons that we can make. And we want to keep, we want to compare uh, Republicans with Democrats, Republicans with independents, and Democrats with independents. We want to make all three of those comparisons. And we want to keep our family-wise, that is across all three of those comparisons, we might want to hold our family-wise comparison level constant at, say, 0.05 or whatever other level that you might decide 0.05 is, is just what is most typical. And the formula that we use to do this is pretty straightforward. And it's this alpha, this new alpha that we're going to use based on the Bonfroni test. And we're going to use this to evaluate each of our significance tests. And um, and so to get that new alpha, we take, um, we take what is our family-wise alpha level that we want, say 0.05, and we divide that by the number of comparisons that we're going to make. And so if, in, in our case, we're going to make three comparisons. If you have a test where you have five, it's going to be five comparisons. If it's two even, it's going to be two comparisons. And, um, Did I do the calculation anywhere? Somebody calculate that quick. Um, so it'd be 0 0.05 divided by three. 0 0.00, what is it? 0 0.016. 0 0.016. 0 0.016. Okay, 0 0.017? Yeah. 0 0.017. So, so if we do the a bond Peroni correction, we get point. 0, 0.017, and that would be the that would be the uh, critical alpha level that we would use for our um, for our test. Uh, nice thing about having modern software, all we have to do is tell SPSS to do the bond Peroni correction for me or for you, and it does all of that. It does all of the math behind the scenes for us. We don't have to, you don't have to think about it again. Um, but this is exactly, this is exactly what it's doing, and we'll be able to replicate the SPSS alpha here uh, as, we, as we work through um, a few more things. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're calculating a new alpha that we're gonna use for our critical alpha level for our three group comparisons, because we want to keep, we want to keep our, we want to keep the likelihood that we make type one error at five percent. We're we're not interested in in having that be higher. How would be? What if we? What if we didn't do a bond Peroni correction? What's the probability that we're going to make a type one error? Zero point zero seven. What is it? Is it? Isn't it this? Isn't it um, 
And so we've got three comparisons, right? And the formula is going to be, let me do this math real quick. So it's, it's 1 minus alpha, so it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.05. Raise that to the um, third power, and 1 minus that. That's the likelihood that we're going to type 1 out. Somebody have that? What's that number? Point zero one, uh, 0.10. The number should be, the number will be greater than 0 0.05. So 1 minus 0 0.05 is what? 0 0.95? 0 0.95. Am I calculating? Remember doing this last week? What do you get? Is it 0.15? Um, that sounds reasonable. If somebody else gets 0.15, I'll say that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else get 0.15 that did it? 0.15? So our, if we don't, is it, but it rounds to, there's, there'd be, it's not 0.15 even, right? It's exactly 0.15. Point one four two six two five. Point one four two six. Yeah, so it wouldn't round to 0.15. But, but it, it would round to point one four, but but uh, uh, close enough for uh, us and, and and the government. So if we're if we are um, if we are, and it just depends on probably it's, it's when you do one minus this. If you if you round this, you're going to probably come to something. Uh, uh, that's going to be just a bit different. Uh, if we um, didn't make any correction at all, at all, we have either a 14 or 15 percent chance of making a type 1 error. That's what this tells us. And uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's a level of type 1 error tolerance or risk that you can live with. Um, and if it is, then um, go forth and publish that, and and see how it see how um, and, and and you might because there's a lot of people that don't do uh, 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 corrections for type one errors. It's not a it's not a prerequisite for getting your research published. It just sometimes depends on the luck of the draw and the argument that you can make for for not doing it, or the luck of the draw in terms of the reviewers that 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 um, uh, set eyes on your. Um, on your manuscript and, and then uh, approve it for publication or otherwise. Um, um, and so, uh, in, in this case, uh, if we if we make this adjustment, then we can keep our alpha level at 0 0.05 uh, instead of that 0 0.14, 0 0.15 that we'd have if we didn't make that adjustment. And the adjustment that we make, at least the Bonfroni adjustment, would just have us to do this simple calculation. Take what your what your family wise um, um, uh, what your uh, alpha for your family wise error rate is, and divide it by the number of comparisons that you're that you're making. Um, fairly conservative, uh, by, and by conservative, you're probably a uh, greater likelihood of um, lack statistical power, greater likelihood of making a type 2 error. Another comparison, I pronounce it SIDAC, I've never heard it pronounced differently. And this is a, 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 another um, post hoc comparison that you can get from SPSS. And the calculation, uh, as you can see, is a little bit more complex, but nothing that any of us wouldn't be able to do, and um, we get a number. We get a number um, that really substantively isn't that much different. Our von Peroni correction, as I calculated, was 1.6.017, and uh, we get 0 0.017 there if we round to if we round to three decimal places, and so the. The difference is not is not huge between between um, these two different um, postdoc comparisons, and so that's just two examples. And as you'll see in SPSS, there's another 
my guess is 15 that we could pick from that it allows us. And there's been books written on this topic. Uh, I don't know if he's um, in sociology, Toothaker? Uh, is there a professor over there named Tooth? Are you sociology? Yeah. That's no Toothaker? I think he retired because that uh, retired or left, one of the two. Uh, but he was, he was, that was his, that was his area of expertise. That was his specialty. He did, um, he did post-talk comparisons. That's all he spent a whole academic career. And he had a book. Um, you know those about green books? Uh, uh, there's a series of green statistics books. He had a couple green books on, on it. And um, if you took a class, you'd spend um, uh, 16 weeks. You might spend nine weeks talking about postdoc comparisons and, and all of the nuances. We um, we will get through it in we'll get through it in a day. So um, so. Um, if we ask um, if we ask SPSS for post-talk tests, and I'll show you how to do that in case it's not familiar. Uh, I'll show you how to do that uh, here in a little bit. But we can ask for post-talk tests, and you can check the boxes, and you can get all 15 different post-talk tests if you want to, or whatever the number is. It may not quite be that high. And, and you can sort of shop those around and see which one sounds the best or seems the sexiest or give you the best results, uh, whatever you choose. But, but probably for my money, um, so LSD is just least significant difference. That's no correction at all. Even though they call, it's a, po but, so there's no, we're not, we're not correcting for type one air right there at all. Von Peroni is the test that we talked about uh, previously. And SIDAC is the, the test that we, um, we just talked about. And so you can ask for those three. You can say, I want to do post hoc test, uh, and, and I want you to produce the post hoc test for, uh, for these three, or, 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 or maybe you want to just do Bonferroni, or maybe you, you don't want any correction, and you just would do LSD then. Um, uh, that sort of comes off. That's on, that's, uh, yeah. That is, you could sort of edit that out of that tape in a way that the uh, faculty at the University of Oklahoma are encouraging his graduate students to. Did I say just do LSD then? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, just do LSD then. But, um, who, ha who hasn't, really? Um, um, and so just to. Uh, um, Reading this is, is probably pretty straightforward, but I just want to make sure that we, um, everything is reported twice for all of our tests. And so we have Democrat and Independent, and then we go down here, we find Independent and Democrat again, right? We have Democrat and Republican, and I can find, there's no difference between Democrat and Republican, and Republican and Democrat in terms of different, but the sign of the difference is gonna be different, but the magnitude is, the absolute magnitude and, and therefore the significance test is exactly the same. So, so you have twice as much information as you really need because that's just the way that, that, that it's produced in SPSS. And we can see that um, if, we, if we go back, um, if we go back and look at our um, means, we can see that Democrats um, talk significantly more about politics than independents. And that's significant because it tells me that right here. And this is the, they talk on average 0.7 days more per week, because that's the, the metric is in days per week. So um, they talk uh, less than one day per week, but more than uh, a half a day uh, uh, per week, more about, uh, uh, they discuss politics um, that much more. Uh, no difference between Democrats and Republicans, and a difference between independents and Republicans, right? Independent and Republican, the difference is significant at 0 0.05. And so if you can't follow that very well from your chair, you'll have this in your notes. And then if we do the Bonferroni correction, we come to substantively the same conclusion, right? And then if we do the, the SIDEC, we come again to the, 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 the same conclusion. Um, the one risky run, and this is where the this is where your uh, set of ethics that guides how you do research and how you 
present your research would, would come into play. Let's say I was faced with the dilemma. I did no correction and then bottom throwing, bottom throwing correction. I have significant results with no correction, but then I look at the von Peroni correction, and because it is making that correction, maybe those results, maybe it was maybe it was 0.05 here, and if you correct for that, it's going to be a number greater than 0.05. It's probably not going to be 0.15, but it might be, depending on the number of comparisons, it might be 0.07, but it's going to be some number greater. Which do you go with? Do you, do you, oh, I'm not going to do the von Peroni test? I'm going to go with the uh, no correction because I like those results better. Could you report you made a cycle error? Huh? Doesn't that mean you made a cycle error? Doesn't mean you made the type of one error, but it's more likely that you're going to make a type one error here than here. But if you use this one, you're going to be more likely to make a type two error than a type one error. So, um, so that would just be, and I've been, uh, I, I don't know who, anybody that's done more than a few years of research that hasn't been in that exact same situation where, where the results here are something that is, um, you're confident that, that your manipulations work and hypotheses are going to be confirmed. Um, this is going to be an easy path to get this published. Here, and then here, it becomes more convoluted because it's not, it's not quite so clear. And so uh, I can't tell you what you need to do in those situations, but but um, uh, it, it just, it, it'd be one of those things. Whatever you do, you have to make the argument in the report that you write up. And again, there's a, it's an imperfect process, right? The publication process is imperfect at best. And it's, uh, right, it is, right? It's just not a, it's, just, it's, a, it's a bunch of humans that are uh, reviewing your manuscript and you might get the luck of the draw and you get a few people that skim your manuscript. Maybe they're really, Maybe it's all about theory for them, and yeah, the method part and the statistics is all good, but I care, I because this is a theory that I really care about, so maybe that's where everybody focuses. Or you might get somebody like me, who probably pays less attention to that, and spends more time on this, that, that says, uh, well, you need to do both doc tests here because your your um, uh, type 1 error rate is, is, is unreasonable, or, or whatever. And so, um, that would be that would be the only drawback of the practice that I sort of suggested is if you check all three of these boxes and say give me no correction and give me an extreme correction and then give me a correction in the middle. Uh, what do you do if they're at variance? And uh, that would be something that um, you'll surely run up against, and um, you'll have to um, you'll have to work your way out of it. Um, so far, so good. Questions? So um, I just want to continue our conversation some with uh, bond thrown correction, just to, if for no other reason, build some additional understanding of uh, how we might use this or other corrections to um, to um, uh, in, in, in the research that we do. So we, our, our formula is, is as we know, um, just what is your, what is your family-wise error rate? 0 0.05 is the most typical number that goes there. Divided by the number of comparisons that you're doing, and that's going to be the, the, the Bonferroni corrected rate that you need to use. Um, and so in this example, if I have um, uh, 0.05 and I have seven comparisons, my corrected um, probability would be 0.007. And in this case, we would set the critical alpha level to 0.007. And we would reject, we would reject the null hypothesis if the obtained alpha level was less than or equal to this amount. And then we would indicate that we've corrected for type 1 error using the bond drawing correction, right? Does that make sense? Does that seem fair? It seems a little unfair, doesn't it? It seems a little, seems a little bit, you're going to make me um, jump over this. Instead of 0.05, instead of this, 
I have to get above this or below this, really. Right. Instead of instead of this, you're going to make me get below this in order to reject the null hypothesis. And the answer is yes. That is what a bond filling correction is asking you to do. And if, and if you're going to report that, that's what you would would be expected to do. Um, it does seem it does seem a little bit um, it does seem a little bit um, it does seem a little bit harsh, but but it um, it is nonetheless. Um, I said probably the most popular correction out there. So just another example of how we would use bond filling correction. Um, and so same same different scenario, not a so sort of bracket off our conversation about a nowhere for just a minute. And let's say I was just doing a series of correlations. For whatever reason, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I have some data. I want to do. I'm gonna do a correlational study, and I'm gonna present some correlations that help to under help people to understand some phenomena. And um, and to do that, I want to correlate. Um, I want to correlate um, how pessimistic somebody is, their level of, of, of pessimism. I want to correlate that with how much they trust the media. People who are more pessimistic tend to trust the media less, right? Not, not to suppose there. Um, females are less pessimistic than males as your age, and but, but that isn't significant. Neither is age, neither is education, uh, neither is um, interest. Uh, interest in the campaign is people People who have more interest in a particular political campaign, as interest increases, pessimism goes down. If you're if you're overly pessimistic, why? Apparently, why would you um, bother um, being interested in uh, politics? People who ha um, attend to news more frequently are less pessimistic, and people who talk no difference for people who talk about politics. So I'm doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm doing seven. I'm doing seven. These are all t-tests. I'm doing seven t-tests. And if I do that, my likelihood of making a type one error is not 0.05. It's going to be that. It's going to be use the same formula that we used before. It's going to be one minus the quantity one minus 0.05 raised to the seventh power. Um, and that's going to be that's going to be what my true type 1 error rate uh, uh, is. But I could make a bond, I could do a bond I could do a bond Peroni correction and keep that at 0 0.05 so I have confidence that I have, I have confidence that I am um, um, not uh, uh, making, uh, uh, or at least have uh, decent confidence that I'm not making type 1 error. And, and so our number here is 0.007 that we calculated. And um, we, could, um, we could look through this and we could see is 0 0.001 less than 0 0.007. Yeah. So, so this one is still significant with trust in the media is still significant with the bond Peroni correction, right? So I did the bond Peroni correction. I figured out what my critical alpha is, which is 0.007. I'm going to look at the significance levels for my um, my seven correlations that I did because I do not want to make type one error. And so in this case, I could say that this is that this this is still significant. At P is less than 0.05, using bond Peroni correction. Trust in the media. Will this will this be significant with a bond Peroni correction? No, it's not significant without it. So with it, it's not gonna. Uh, it doesn't work that way, right? And so uh, neither would age, neither would education. How about campaign interest? It's not significant, right? We'd have to say with bond Peroni correction. Uh, campaign interest is not a uh, there's not a significant correlation between it and levels of, uh, of pessimism. 
using a bond for any correction, right? How about attention to news? No, still greater than 0.007. Uh, and then discuss politics, how much it, uh, that wouldn't change. It wouldn't, it would still remain non-significant um, and, and because it's not significant here. So does that, does that make some sense? Uh, that would be, a, that would be a, a, a way to use bond for any correction because you really want to make sure that your air rate stays, the likelihood that you make a type one air rate is going to be 5%. And if we didn't do that, uh, our likelihood of making a type one air rate is going to, um, is going to jump, I guess I didn't calculate it, but the likelihood is going to jump to um, probably pretty close to 50, 50, um, uh, uh, you know, 50 percent chance that you're going to make a type one error. Um, a different way to approach this same analysis uh, with the bond for correction is to calculate the actual obtained bond for correction for each of your tests. And this is what SPSS is doing for. So again, uh, we have the luxury of having a, a, a program where we can check a box and it does the calculation for us, but let's just understand a little bit about how it makes those, um, how it makes those calculations for us. And so, um, um, in this approach, we would simply, if, if we took that formula and you could rearrange that von Freund for formula, and you could see that if you multiply the obtained probability by the number of comparisons that you're doing, you're going to have a von Ferroni corrected probability. And we could we could take that von Ferroni formula and we could rearrange that uh, formula to get to this point. But what we do is we take um, the uncorrected probability and multiply it times the number of comparisons that we're making, and then that would be a von Ferroni corrected um, probability. And so looking at the same data that we looked at before, just approaching it uh, uh, in, in a slightly different manner, we can, instead of, instead of um, getting our 0 .007 von Ferroni corrected uh, amount, we can just take our seven comparisons times the original alpha. So this is the original alpha, and um, this is the original alpha, and this is the original alpha. And so we take the original alpha times the number of comparisons, and that gets us the corrected alpha. In this case, Bonferroni correction would be the would be the, the type of correction we're doing. And so if our original alpha is 0 0.00113, I take it times seven, this is exactly the number that we're gonna get. And we get to exactly the same place we got earlier when we went through, when we went through this slide, that the only one that's significant is this trust in, in the media and after the bond throwing correction, and that's the only one that, that remains below um, 0.05. And so, in some ways, for me anyway, it's a, it's a little easier way to use the bond throwing correction. I want to, I want to, I run some tests. If we're doing correlation analysis, there's no way to tell SPSS to do bond throwing correction for me with, with uh, my correlations. But I can easily do that just knowing that, okay, I'm doing seven correlations if I want to maintain a 0.05, um, if I want to maintain a 0.05 um, uh, probability, uh, what I would do is take each obtained probability times my number of comparisons, in this case seven, and those that, when that number is below 0.05, I can say that um, we reject the null hypothesis that um, we reject the null hypothesis, and we'd say that um, 
uh, we made that rejection uh, using a bond coin uh, correction. Questions? Confusions? Confusion? Multiple confusion? <laughs> Questions? What's that? Yep. Maybe the number of groups and so on. In our example that we were working with, it's three. So um, let's see uh, another um, sort of take on you know using the same using the same logic. Um, we we might be interested in doing um, plan comparisons. Let's say let's say theory. Theory wouldn't suggest that you would make all possible comparisons anyway. And so why, why, make, why do a Bonferroni correction that, that would um, cut across all possible comparisons that you're making? And um, I could find some literature. I don't know. Uh, it, you may or may not be convinced by it. But I could find some literature that says we, we would really only we really only predict a significant difference in, in, in political discussion amongst those people who, um, the, the difference would be between Democrats and independents and Republicans and independents. Because Democrats and Republicans, uh, given the same level of partisanship between somebody that subscribes as a Democrat or somebody that describes themselves as a uh, Republican, we'd expect similar, uh, we expect similar uh, uh, behaviors. But there is this group of, and, and political scientists uh, are somewhat disparaging, I mean, they call them chronic nomads. Uh, because people that, because th th there is a group of people that, that I'm not a Democrat, I'm not even close to a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm not even close to a Republican, I'm an independent. And if you look at those people, they, they tend to be, they tend to be, uh, and, and I have a lot of them in my family, they tend to be less knowledgeable about politics than, than partisans. And so we wouldn't expect, we wouldn't expect there to be a difference between Repo Democrats and Republicans, but we would expect there to be a difference here and here. And so there should be no reason why I have to pay a penalty for, a bond crony penalty for this comparison, because I'm not even interested in making it. So we're gonna do a plan comparison that would, um, that would allow us to uh, do a bond for only correction and, and just make these two comparisons. Thank you. Uh, you're reading my mind. I was going to ask somebody how would we go about doing that. And so in this case, we're, we're only making two comparisons. So you, you would, the corrected alpha would be 0 0.05 divided by 2 instead of 0 0.05 divided by 3. Or if you're working with the actual alpha, it would be the actual obtained alpha times two instead of times three. Right, Amanda? Sure. Sure? Does that make sense? That sure didn't come with um, uh, high degrees of um, confidence. So, um, how many? How many people understand why this would be two instead of three? Right? And, and how do we get the two? How many people? A couple people get it? Three, half the class maybe? More than half the class? <coughs> somebody help Somebody help me while I go drink some water. <laughs> explain why it's two instead of three. You are not interested in checking. Well, it's not about just being interested, it's that Theoretically, again, it makes sense. Right, there is some literature that states that the differences are going to be noticeable only between Democrats and Independents and Republicans and Independents. So you rely on other people having studied the subject before and telling you, don't look at Democrats and Republicans because they are not going to be any different. But focus on Democrats and Independents and Republicans. Right, and we're only doing two comparisons, and right instead of three, if if we didn't do plan comparisons, if we just looked at all possible combinations, we'd have three, right? 
Damn it, we'd have the three that are listed here. We're saying we only care about two of the three. So our corrected Bonferroni, we only have to pay the price for two of them because we are not doing the third because we don't care about it. And so we shouldn't have to pay that price. And if you, if you call your analyses plan comparisons, people that know about these things would know exactly what you did. You didn't look at all possible comparisons, which is oftentimes what we do because we may not have theory that helps us understand that or past literature that helps us understand that. So we have a couple of really interesting independent variables and we just look at all possible combinations of that. Chris? Would it be sketchy? Because, right, this is a post hoc test. I've already run my uh, ANOVA and I can see you know, the differences between these. But I see that the means for Democrats and Republicans are relatively close. Can I now decide to make plan comparisons knowing that those means are relatively close and I'm unlikely to find a difference? Or is that sketchy because I didn't do it? Well, I, I think we each define sketchy for ourselves, right? But, but if I, the textbook, the textbook answer of how we do research is before you ever collect that data, you have a theory that's going to tell you that there's not going to be a difference between Republicans and, and Democrats. So you're not even going to, even before you run that test, even before you collect your data, you've already got that hypothesis. Because you've, you've, of course, written out all of your hypotheses before you ever started analyzing your data, right? And, and you didn't hypothesize. Democrats and Republicans. And so that would be the textbook way that we teach research, but it's not the way that anybody I know that does research <laughs> does research. And but it's not something that it's not something that we we don't self disclose that because it we we don't because it it doesn't reflect well in our um our um our, our work. If we yeah, you know, I did if, if we do exactly what we, um, I saw that the means were uh, wide between Democrats and independents and, and Republicans and independents, not so wide for Democrats and Republicans. So I just, cha I just made up the hypothesis. And, and so that, that would be, that would be um, yeah, that just, but, but I mean, I've, I've been around enough researchers. I've done enough research myself. Uh, call it sketchy. Uh, it happens all the time. So either half the social scientists in the country are sketchy, or or there's a disconnect between maybe what we teach and and um, and, and their practice. And and I would say it's probably that there, there there can be there can be that disconnect. And there's a there's an exploratory element to most all research that we do. And and I guess you would couch that in that. But I think oftentimes. I mean, I worked with people on research. I've done the analysis for them or with them, and then I read the paper that they write, and it does not reflect what we did. <laughs> it, the they're not, it's not at variance with the results that we came up with, but but how it's laid out is at variance with. Well, it'd be, you'd probably have to have a. It, it's it's uh, is it is it did they lie? No. Uh, if a lawyer looked at it and, and, and we got the federal government involved in it, would they be able to put somebody in jail? Nope. Uh, uh, would they take away your federal funding? Probably not. But it's but there's a there's a level of there's a bit of a disconnect. There can be a disconnect between, and, and a lot of times it's just what's not said. You know, we report that we did A, B, and C, but we didn't report that we did, you know, D through Z as well. And, and that just didn't make it into the manuscript because we didn't find anything there that was of interest to us. So I don't know uh, why I got on that. Maybe because I'm, uh, I took a good drink of water. And um, um, but but uh, long answer to a, a good question. Uh, other Amanda, do you have a question? I just have a okay. So plan comparisons are plan comparisons are when you eliminate the Republicans and Democrats and you have your It's for theoretical. It's before you do the postdoc test. It's for theoretical or logical reasons. You decided, or you determined. I, I don't have a hypothesis that says Democrats should be different than Republicans. I'm not hypothesizing that. So why should I pay the price for that? I do have a hypothesis for Democrat for one and three. And Chris was saying that if you do that, if you do plan comparisons based on the 
things that you're observing, and you said that's not really what did I say? Um, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's just, um, that's what he said. Right, right. Because yeah. when you're looking at I'm the, just trying to like, make sure I know. Right, no, because if you look at the, at the means, then it means that you didn't take you didn't into account the theory. Right, you're not looking at yeah. the data after the, the, the textbook, we wouldn't have the means before we wrote out our hypothesis, right? right? We Before we ever... Before we ever analyze our data, you write. Your, isn't that what we? Isn't that what you're taught? Yes. That, I don't know that. I, I don't know that anybody ever told me that in the methods class, to be honest. With, but but that's what I read in methods books. That's what that's. It seems to be the, the the we write out the hypotheses, design our study, collect the data, test the hypotheses. If none of them work out, start that process over yes. again, and. Um, write another set of hypotheses and collect some data and, and analyze your data, right? That's that's the that's the chain that we sort of work through. And and I'm just saying that there's there's some variations there that 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 um, come into play. And, and a lot of times it's it's couched as um, exploratory, right? That it that it um, or 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 um, there are research questions which are uh, um, um, by nature uh, more exploratory. So example two, what was example one by the way? I guess that was example one. So this was example one. Example two, I don't for one, some reason I decided to start numbering in here. Uh, do I have a three? Um, and so just uh, to finalize this, uh, as we talked about, we would our bond throwing correction would be based on two comparisons instead of three comparisons, and we can calculate the probability for the plan comparisons using uh, the least significant difference probability because there's no uh, uh, correction there, and our knowledge of the bond throwing correction. And we can get the, um, uh, uh, we correct these probabilities in the same way that we did with the correlation. So what we would do is we could uh, get our post-op test. We would just have to generate the least significant difference post-op test. We probably would not have a need for these two. And we have um, our original alpha. We take our original alpha, which is this number here times two, because we're doing two comparisons, and that gives us our corrected alpha. And, and we can see, um, in, in this case, with these plant comparisons, using von Froning correction, I still reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between those two groups, right? And so the key here is we, we're, we're using two here instead of three, because we're only making two comparisons instead of three comparisons. This is the original data that we had. And we should be able to come up with, now that we know how we, uh, we know a different, another way to come up with the bond throwing correction, we can take our least significant difference, which is no correction, and Democrats versus independents, we get 0.0013. If we wanted to get the bond Ferroni correction, we just would take 0 0.0013, times three, right? And that's going to be equal to this number right here. So it's going to round, it's going to just round to that number. So if we ask SPSS for post hoc tests, for least significant difference, bond throwing and SIDAC, at least for bond throwing, we should be able to use the LSD table to come up with the bond throwing corrections if we wanted to. Because it really is a matter of taking this probability times the number of comparisons that we're making. We're not making six, we're actually making three, right? Because everything's before the twice. So 
not times six, it's times three. So now you know how SPSS gets that value. Um, and in some cases, it's fine just to let SPSS do it for us. In other cases, particularly if you're doing planning comparisons, it, um, you'd want to do that yourself so you can do the planning comparisons. Questions about one-way ANOVAs? What are we covering? One-way ANOVAs. We covered um, effect sizes, post hoc tests, mm -hmm. planning comparisons. All good? Reasonably good? Up there somewhere, looking around. So let's start on multi-factor ANOVA. Um, and you'll see as you get to the end of this slide deck, uh, there's some syntax that I put in there that we won't cover in class. But if you're interested in, um, in um, um, this simple effects analysis that we'll talk about, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's better to do that with SPSS. Other times it's better to do that by hand. By hand. Um, and um, so if you look ahead in the slides uh, and you see a bunch of syntax, you can um, cross through those slides because we're not, we're not going to, we won't cover that in class. Um, I will try to get through analysis of covariance today. If we don't get through that today, you'll still be able to do your homework. And let's, um, because I said we're going to do this, I don't want to forget. So do five, five, right? Four, five. Four, five. Four, five. Four, five. So this is 429 or is it right? 329. Yeah, I don't know what I was dreaming when I put that in there. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's, not, it's not May, is it? It's, it's, it's not March. April. It's not April now, it's, it's just March. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just way ahead of, you know. So um, everybody realized that except for me just now. So. Um, the new due date is somebody checking Canvas to confirm, uh, given the problems I have with dates. The new due date should be uh, 4, 5, 17 at 3, I think I said it's at 3, 10 p.m. So, um, and what you need to do is use SPSS to do a two-way ANOVA with theoretically, with just uh, open quotes, don't worry about the closed quotes and theoretically, <laughs> but um, <laughs> theoretically meaningful variables. Um, right, and by theoretically, there has to be some logic there, right? And, and there's got to be a little bit of intuition there that, that I can um, sort of pick up on and that you can pick up on. And so do you have to be able to say, yeah, this theory hypothesizes this? I'm not looking for that necessarily, but just, just don't take some random factors and, uh, and try to um, uh, do this. And I'd rather have you be a, a bit more thoughtful. And I think with all of your data that you're looking at, that won't be a problem. And then you're going to examine the simple effects, which we're going to talk about. And you can do that regardless of whether the simple, the interaction is significant or not. Um, and, and that's regardless of significance. And, and this, the significance that we're talking about there is the significance of the interaction in your two-way ANOVA, uh, which you'll understand as we move forward. Then you're going to do all of the other things that I ask you to do to include writing the report, and then giving me a um, table with the cell and the marginal means, so the, uh, the means for um, all the crosses plus the means uh, that you have on the margins uh, for those crosses. And uh, I'll show you an example of that. Thank you. Make sense? I did want to ask, so I was trying to think through variables like while we've been talking. So with the dependent variable, since it does have to be continuous, or yeah, like interval ratio it is, um, are we back to doing, so like if I was to use cohesion or closeness, am I back to doing like the sum or the mean of all of those items, or am I just choosing one item? That'd be a theoretical or sort item? of a methodological question that you would have to answer, but in most cases it probably would be using the sum okay. scale. But it but it's not always that it would be a it would be a it's a it's a researcher question that that person would would have to answer. But in most cases 
in most cases, if you collected multiple items that represent some variable or some, you wouldn't analyze those items individually. Okay, because I just figured like your discussed politics was just one though, right? That is yeah. a single item measure, so yeah. I was trying to think like I need to find something like that or, okay, but no, mean it, will work. No, that okay. mean will work absolutely um, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Good, other questions? So let me let me do this before um, before we um, take a break. So um, just so we have this, and, and you have it um, at the end of the part one video, uh, in, just in case you need it. So um, we're going to do a two-way ANOVA, and I'll have to go back and, and and redo this a couple times after the break. But I want to get I want to get at least uh, this part done. So there's a couple ways to do um, there's a couple ways to do this, but what we're going to always use general linear model, not to be confused with generalized linear model. So gen general linear model, and then univariate. And by univariate, we're talking about just the number of independent variables, the number of dependent variables we have. So univariate in this case is we have one dv. Multivariate, as we'll talk about next week is multiple dependent variables. So we're going to do univariate analysis and then this dialog box um, I'm sure all of you would be able to figure out what you need to do here. Uh, we're going to use uh, how much the person trusts the media. This would be a multiple item scale uh, where there are several questions that, that get at that. And that's our dependent variable. And then our fixed factors would be where we insert our independent variables. Uh, in our case, we're not going to use random factors. And for the homework, you don't need to use covariates, but uh, we're going to talk about covariates at some point, um, perhaps towards the end of the day. So we're going to do um, fixed factor for um, male-female, and then we're going to do level of education. Uh, we're going to do party identification, not level of education. Um, why wouldn't we use level of education? It's a continuous variable, yes. And you, you, it, number of years of education, for example, would be a, a continuous variable that you wouldn't, you wouldn't use as an independent variable in, in, in ANOVA. So we have uh, dependent variables, how much they trust the media. Our fixed factors or independent variables is whether they're a female or not, and um, party identification, the, the uh, Democrat, Republican, and Independent. And we could press OK and it would give us the, um, the usual or the sort of uh, standard uh, output. A couple things that you probably will want to ask for. Um, and I'll just start at the top and I'll work my way down and we'll see some of these examples. Um, because we have two independent variables, in most cases, we're interested in looking at the interaction between those variables. And we'll talk about what interactions are here in a few minutes. And uh, if our interaction is significant, oftentimes the best way to understand that would be to graph those two variables out. And so um, if SPSS wouldn't crash on me, um, we would have graphed those two variables out. So let me get... Um, and by the way, my test, my little thing that uh, SPSS now is as slow as it's ever been. I did the little, did, William, does yours still work? Uh, just give us some time. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. It's not, it's not my machine. It is, um, I'm confident that it's SPSS. I didn't update it. I went back and checked the host file. And nothing's changed. But it was like um, Johnny on the spot there for, um, for a couple weeks. Um, and then now we're back to, um, it's open. Um, and so I'm going to find my data that I had, uh, recently used files. And I'm going to do um, univariate. And I'm going to do trust in media. I'm going to do female. And I'm going to do party ID. And then I'm going to do plots. So we want to we want to graph out um, our interaction, and you could do I'm going to do 
put female on a horizontal line and do separate lines for Democrat, Republican, and Independent, so add that. And because I don't know how that's going to look and I want to look at both options, I'm going to do that the other way too, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. The story will be the same, it's just that it might be a little clearer in one way um, than the other. If you have a three-way interaction, so you have three independent variables, you'd have to do separate plots for your third variable, which makes it, um, uh, it just adds another level as you would um, suspect complexity. So there's my plots. I can do my post hoc test. And here's the 15 different tests I can choose from. I, again, I didn't count them, so you might count them and find that there's only 12. And um, uh, yes, I was wrong. So um, do we need a post hoc test for female? Why? Two levels, right? It's it's female or not female, and so if there's a significant if there's a significant main effect, just look at the beans, and it, female might be higher or lower. There's no need to do post hoc tests. In fact, if we did a post hoc test for it, SPSS would give us a little warning and tell us uh, you don't need to do that. Just uh, uh, and it, and it won't give you because it, it doesn't know what to do with it. So it would just it would just it would just give you that. Um, but in our case, because Power ID has got three levels, or three groups uh, instead of levels, um, I slide Power ID over there, and then you can see all of our options over here light up. And I'm going to just select those three that we've talked about. And again, you could um, do some research, and some of these other ones might be better for you in certain situations. Um, and um, we're not going to cover that in, in this class. So there's our postdoc test. And then our, under options, um, we want descriptive statistics. If you don't ask for that, you won't know what the mean differences are because that's the only place to get the mean the means. Um, and we're going to ask for a homogeneity test. Uh, what name do we attach to the front of that usually? There's a person's last name. The Veen's test, yeah. And so we'll talk about that. And then we want um, we want uh, estimates of effect size, which in this case would be partial partial eta square. Other things that you might want to get here. Um, if you ask for parameter estimates, you actually get Bs. Remember from regression analysis? You get Bs, uh, so you get coefficients. It dummy codes your factors for you uh, in a way, so you get, you get Bs. But um, I've never found a good need for that, or a good reason for that, other than if I didn't want to dummy code myself and I just wanted to save some time and run regression, that would be one way that you could do that. And say, OK. And OK, and somewhere I have my results. And these results should be pretty close to what we will look at when we get back from the break. And so let's take 15 minutes, and um, we'll continue.